So cheetahs then, fastest land animal, right? But how fast can they run? About 70 miles an hour. And they'll get from 0 to 60 in about three seconds, just over three seconds. All right, so you know, that's fast as the fastest Lambo or Ferrari. Okay. And they can only run that fast for a very short period of time. Okay. Why can they only run that fast for a very short period of time? They get too hot. During that bout where they're running fast, they're essentially oxidizing so much fuel generate so much heat that they run the risk of overheating. took in June a place called the Chief Conservation Fund in Namibia and uh, it's a place that works with the conservation of cheetahs and <coughs> they don't like to have captive cheetahs but they have orphaned cheetahs that are very difficult to release back into the wild. It's extremely difficult to do that with cheetahs. And so the cheetah being an animal that's basically just built for speed. All right? They're definitely runners, not fighters won't fight. They're quite, you know, reasonably afraid of people. Um, there was a couple of instances where there were wild cheetahs out, and I got out of the car and walked towards them, and they just kind of run off a little bit, and you walk towards them a bit more, and they run off a little bit. They don't want to get involved in any altercation, because they're simply built for speed. And any damage means that they can't run as fast, and that impinges their ability to catch people, or run away from predators. Okay. So, they're just built for speed. Some of their adaptations are phenomenal, really. They have a super enlarged heart and lungs. Their spinal column is like um, a very sort of flexible, stiff piece of plastic. So when they run, they sort of flex that spinal column and it gives them sort of ping, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sort of get, gets flexed and that enables them to ping, ping like that. It gives them more power their legs. And so, enlarged nostrils, so they get air into their lungs, eyes face forward. Look at those um, little black stripes on their face that come down from their eyes. You see, I think it's more evident there. See? Those black lines there. Well, there's obviously lots of superstitious stories about them, about the, the tears that her mother cheetah crying when she lost her cubs like that. But they believe what those little black lines are for. They act as two things. First, to prevent um, reflection of sunlight into their eyes when they're running. But also, they act as gun sights. Because if you're running 70 miles an hour and you're chasing something over uneven ground, twisting and turning, to catch their prey, they usually trip them, trip their prey. Well, at 70 miles an hour, you've got to see that back leg trip it. You know, so, so they believe these sort of act like gun sights. So super well adapted animal for speed, speed, speed. But they can't sustain that speed because they build up so much heat. And they run the risk of getting brain damaged, all right, if that heat builds up. So again, it all comes down to the enzymes in their body and the optimum temperature in which those enzymes operate. And if you increase the temperature above a certain limit, the enzymes don't work as well. And if you continue to exceed the temperature, the structure of the enzyme not only gets altered a little bit, but can permanently break down. And if the structure of the enzyme is permanently altered, then we said we denatured the protein, we denatured the enzyme. All right, so denaturation is sort of a permanent breakdown or change in the structure of the enzyme. So it doesn't work anymore. <clears throat> Um, they keep that speed up. Oh, that's a good question. I think for, they can sustain that top speed for about 30 seconds. Okay, I think I've got that right. It's called the same thing? Ah, no, cold. 
cold is, and that's a really good question. All right. What was the question? Is cold the same? Not so much. So I'll come back to pH. But the reason why temperature and pH affects enzyme function is because they alter the structure of the enzyme. Temperature is outside of the optimum range, and pH values outside the optimum pH values can alter the structure of the enzyme. And remember, the function is related to its structure. If you alter the structure, you'll alter its function. So, <clears throat> temperature then. Each enzyme has got its own optimal temperature at which it'll work. When I say optimal temperature, I mean that at that temperature, it will catalyze the conversion of substrate to product at the fastest rate for that enzyme, okay? at its optimal temperature. So here's what I want to do. <coughs> Here are the axes. Okay. Let's have this axis to be temperature in degrees Celsius. And you don't have to put the numbers on there. You don't have to put a scale on. And this, we'll think of this as a uh, rate. Rate of the reaction. Maybe number of product molecules produced per second. What would a graph of rate against temperature look like for one enzyme, just one particular enzyme? What would it look like? <clears throat> just think about it. Draw those axes and think about what that graph might look like. You've got to think. Remember that voice in your head says, I don't know. At the very least, draw the axes and start scribbling on it, right? That might generate some ideas. <clears throat> sure? Oh, I don't want you to look in the book. Don't get the answer out of the book. But if you've already read that section in the chapter, which I guess you really should have, then maybe you already know the answer. And the reason why I don't want you to look in the book, because I think it's an important exercise for you to try and reason and work these things out. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so let me show you sort of process that you might have gone through to figure this out. Firstly, you know that each enzyme has an optimum temperature, a temperature at which it catalyzes the reaction as fast as it can for the enzyme. So let's put a point up there where it's got a high rate, and we'll say the temperature is just right there, okay? You also know that outside of that optimum temperature, the enzyme doesn't work as well. Now, I've mainly focused on temperatures above the optimum. And what happens at temperatures above the optimum? They don't work as well. If they don't work as well, that means they have a lower rate. So you might say the line maybe looks something like that, okay? As we increase temperature, the rate goes down. And I've said that beyond a certain temperature, at a certain temperature, many enzymes, their structure breaks down permanently and they become denatured. And if they become denatured, they no longer function and they don't catalyze conversion of any substance to product, okay? So it might look like that. What about, though, on the cooler side? Not talked about that yet. Do you think if we reduce the temperature below the enzyme, that's going to denature the enzyme? In fact, it doesn't denature it. Think about increasing the temperature, it starts to vibrate the molecules, and as we increase the temperature, it vibrates more. All right? It vibrates so much as we get too hot, then bonds start to break. But as we cool things down, vibrations get less. And the motion of the molecules slows down a little bit. So what do you think might happen at cooler temperatures? The rate does decrease. And it kind of does that. It's an asymmetrical curve. The rate decreases not 
necessarily because the enzyme structure is getting changed, but just because things aren't moving as quickly. And so the number of substrate molecules that are going to collide with the active site decreases as we reduce the temperature. Think about it this way. It's why we put food in the fridge, right? All we're doing is decreasing the rate at which microenzymes are functioning. If we decrease the rate at which the microbe enzymes function, the microbes don't break down your food as fast, and they don't grow as much. So every time you open and close your fridge, think about hmm, 4 degrees Celsius, enzymes work very slowly. Okay. All right, so that's what the graph of temperature against rate would look like. It's asymmetrical. So there's the optimum. So do you understand why it would have that profile and what's happening at the higher temperatures and why it might have this profile and look like this at the lower temperatures? <coughs> yeah. Okay, now um, I'd like to put some numbers on this, at least the temperature axis. What about for you, for most of your enzymes? What, you, what temperature do you think is their optimum? 98. Oh. <laughs> What's body temperature in Celsius? Someone must know. I don't know. Where are you? Cameron knows, but he's not here. Cameron knows, but he's not here. Someone got his cell number? Give him a call. Fahrenheit. Was it Fahrenheit? 90 what? 98.7. 6. That's in Fahrenheit. Now, we are no longer in Stone Age. Okay? Celsius. What's that in Celsius? Yeah, the conversion is about, take away 32 and half it. That's about the conversion. But I want something much more accurate than that. So I'm going to give that to you as a little bit of homework. What is body temperature in Celsius? Because I need to know. Oh yeah, you probably, it's a good time to get out your cell phone, right? Because they've all got Celsius. 33? You don't think so. I can Google it. I'm doing it on my phone. I know you can. Yeah, I'll give you his homework. I'll know exactly what it is. Okay, so this optimum temperature for us might be around. I'll put 37. Okay. 37. Okay, what about for, um, I don't know, an Arctic fish? Fish that lives up in the Arctic. What do you think it's <coughs> enzyme optimum? Oh, it's temperature <coughs> optimum. Zero Celsius. Maybe around zero or four degrees Celsius. Sure. Yeah. So its graph <coughs> might look something like so I scaled it so I had four just here. You know, crikey, at your body temperature, they'd be denatured, fry it, no good. But then they might function well past the freezing mark. Okay? And there is some enzyme action even below freezing. Okay? Um, what about for a bacteria growing in a thermal vent at 300 Celsius? Okay. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be switching on to biotechnology. Okay? And there's a reaction that we're going to run in the biotech called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And it relies on an enzyme to catalyze a reaction at quite high temperatures, sort of in the 80s and 90s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, that sort of range of Celsius. It's very hot. Okay. Where on earth would they find an enzyme that works correctly at those temperatures? Where? Where would you find an enzyme that works correctly at those temperatures? 
Sorry? Maybe the desert. In fact, what they did, they found it in an aquatic organism. I'm pretty sure from um, a hot spring in Yellowstone Park. Okay. And the company that found it patented it and is earning boatloads of money on it. Yes, the panel is getting Okay, so human enzymes work very well between 35 and 40 Celsius. Outside of those ranges, they start to not work quite as well. <clears throat> now, I don't want you to think that enzymes get killed, because they're molecules, right? They don't really get killed. Do you use the word denatured? When we boil an egg, the albumin, which is the white of the egg, all right, that protein becomes denatured. We increase temperature so much that that runny, almost clear albumin denatures and turns hard and white. Okay? What's another way we could denature that protein, the albumin? We can heat it up, that denatures. Our albumin isn't an enzyme, but it's a protein, and all proteins can get denatured. What's another way we could denature it? Yes, or did you say decrease pH? I said it. Put it in a pH value that was outside of its optimum. We can put it in an acid. You ever gone and seen pickled eggs? Pickled eggs look like boiled eggs. They're not boiled, but they're pickled. They're put in vinegar, pH about 4.5. At that pH, the protein gets denatured. Okay? And it just looks like a boiled egg. It doesn't taste like a boiled egg, but it looks like one. So, hot springs about 70 Celsius, okay? If that's the temperature of water and the organisms that live there, chances are their pH optimum will be around that value. And here's the graphs that you guys just drew, okay? And these are in your book. So now pH, let's have a look at pH. Each enzyme has its what? Optimum pH. pH at which catalyzer reaction is the fastest rate for that enzyme. And different enzymes have different fastest rates. So, given what we've said about pH, I want you now to draw this graph. Again, don't look in the book. Imagine this is pH. Draw what the profile would look like for an enzyme rate against pH. Think it's going to look similar to that? This graph? Temperature graph? You think that, firstly, I've said that enzymes have an optimal pH, right? So, at that pH value, whatever it is, fastest rate. And then above that pH, pH starts to interfere with the enzyme structure. So, maybe something like that. Yeah. And then what? Do you think it would tail off and be asymmetrical like the temperature graph? Symmetrical graph, and I've not done a very good job of drawing a symmetrical graph, but it would be symmetrical. Because at pH values above or below its optimum, those pH values 
start to interfere with its structure. Okay? It's not like temperature in that respect. It's similar, but not the same. So we end up with these symmetrical graphs. Now I'll give you two sort of extre almost extreme examples on this graph. Let's have a look at this enzyme pepsin. Pepsin has a pH optima of about two. Where in your body do we have a this is an enzyme that's found in your body? Where in your body do we have a yeah? pH two is in your stomach. Okay? because production of hydrochloric acid. And so the enzymes in your stomach environment have an optimal pH, a pH two, battery acid almost, that's when they work less. You put them in a neutral pH, they basically stop working, they don't work. Okay, so, but let's look at this enzyme trypsin. It's got a pH of about eight, just maybe a fraction over eight. Trypsin is an enzyme that's released into your digestive system, into your gut, downstream of your stomach. So when you eat food, it goes down your esophagus into your stomach. Very acidic pH. But the enzymes in your stomach work well at that pH. Okay? What about salivary amylase? What do you think is its pH ultimate? Once in your saliva. Be neutral. The stuff that we used in labs, pH ultimate is about 7.6. So, mixes with your food, as soon as it hits your stomach, what do you think is going to happen to that slivery amylase? Denatured. Denatured, pretty much. Okay. One reason why you have a very acidic stomach is so that if you ingest potentially harmful organisms, that pH can take care of those harmful organisms, can kind of um, kill them, break them down, stop their enzymes working so well. Okay. So, the food leaves your stomach and goes into your duodenum. And the food that leaves your stomach goes into your duodenum, pH 2, hits your duodenum. Well, that triggers the release of bile from your liver, from the bile duct in your liver, released into your duodenum. That contains a whole bunch of um, alkaline salts and emulsifying salts. So, Changes the pH from 2, brings it right up to pH 8. All right. And that's where trypsin comes into play. All right. pH optimum is about 8. All right. But you can see why the graph is symmetrical. All right. So that takes care of temperature and pH. Just have a look at other things that affect the enzymes and how they work. We've got cofactors. Now, cofactors are small, inorganic, non-protein molecules. An example of an enzyme cofactor would be zinc, for example. But many of the minerals that, you know, when you take vitamin supplements, vitamins and minerals, Zinc, copper, magnesium, iron, those kind of substances, many of them act as enzyme cofactors. Now think of these cofactors as enzyme helper molecules. So the enzyme will function without them, but it doesn't function very well. With these cofactors, the enzyme functions properly, functions the way it's meant to function. Now, there are lots of enzymes in your immune system which require cofactors. One of the important cofactors for enzymes in your immune system is zinc. Okay. So if you're deficient in zinc, very often your immune system takes a hit. Okay. So that diet of you know, Pepsi and pizza and ding dongs, right? Not a lot of zinc in those. All right, so cofactors are important. They just help the enzyme function properly. And then we've got coenzymes. Coenzymes are organic molecules. For example, many of the vitamins you take act as coenzymes. And coenzymes, think of them as also as enzyme helpers. They help the enzyme function correctly. 
The enzyme will work without them, but not nearly as well. Okay, so coenzymes and cofactors then, enzyme helpers. All right. The enzyme works better with them, and they're required a lot of the time. And then on the other end, we've got these enzyme inhibitors. Well, obviously, as the name implies, these stop the enzymes from working, or at least interfere with how efficiently they work. And when we talk about enzyme inhibitors, we've got competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. And here's the difference. And this graphic shows it quite well, I think. Here's our enzyme. Okay. A competitive inhibitor competes for the active site. So it competes with the substrate for the active site. And the competitive inhibitors are typically molecules that have a very similar structure to the substrate. And so, sorry? Um, oh, hang on, I'll tell you. All right. Because um, there's a big punchline when I talk about inhibitors. What was the first slide I showed with enzymes? Do you remember? The very first one I showed when we started this section. Yeah, the birds, right? Condor, peregrine falcon. So, competitive inhibitors then are molecules that compete with the active site. They essentially get in the active site, so the substrate can't, and so that's how they reduce the rate of the reaction. Okay. Non-competitive inhibitors are molecules that bind to a part of the enzyme distant to the active site, but by binding to that area distant to the active site, they change the shape of the active site. See the way the shape of the active site has been changed there. And by changing the shape of the active site, the substrate can no longer fit in. Okay. So you can see the difference between competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. Yeah. Now, if the inhibitor binds with covalent bonds, and it sort of permanently bonds to the enzyme, then it's an irreversible inhibitor. Okay. So some of these inhibitors, the molecules, the chemicals themselves, bond with covalent bonds to the enzyme, and then they completely knock out the enzyme molecule. Okay. No, it's not denaturing it. doesn't change its structure necessarily. But it irreversibly bonds to the enzyme. And so if it irreversibly bonds to the active site, well, no more substrates can get it. If it irreversibly bonds to an area away from the active site that changes the shape of the active site, then substrates can't get it. So it knocks the enzyme out. Okay. And if it bonds with weak bonds, like the bonds with weak bonds, like sorry, weak bonds. What would be weak bonds? Maybe hydrogen bonds, Van der forces, or ionic bonds, which are weak in water. So, if it bonds with a weak bond, then it's a reversible inhibitor. So the weak bonds can be broken, in which case it might bond, then the bonds are broken, it comes away and the enzyme can function again. All right, so what are some examples of these inhibitors then? DDT is an example of an irreversible inhibitor. And I can't remember if it's a competitive or non-competitive inhibitor. Okay? But DDT and other poisons 
are examples of irreversible inhibitors. And that's how they function. They interfere with a critical pathway by knocking out certain enzymes. And that's how they function. So many insecticides that we use, like DDT, functions because it takes out some of the enzymes in critical pathways of the insects. But we didn't know this, although we should have listened to Rachel Carson, who cautioned us about the use of DDT. Um, we didn't realize that DDT would also affect the enzymes that lay down eggshell in birds. Okay. And above certain concentrations of DDT, the eggshells are so thin when the eggs are laid that when the bird incubates them, the eggs break. And so it only really had a big impact on birds like condors, falcons, eagles, birds at the very top of the food pyramid because DDT gets magnified as you go up the food chain. It's present in low levels of the insects, but then it gets magnified as you go up different levels of the food chain. So the highest concentrations are going to be in organisms at the top of the food chain. Okay? And so that's why these birds were affected the most. Antibiotics are another example of enzyme inhibitors. They kill, anti they kill bacteria because they, many of them interfere with the enzymes that let the bacteria make the bacterial cell wall. So loads of money is spent each year on researching enzyme inhibitors because they're valued as drugs to do certain things. Are antibiotics reversible? Um, I, you know what, I don't know. Because different antibiotics work in different ways. I would imagine many of them are not reversible. <coughs> They no longer function, so at some point they'll probably get broken down. Does that have a superbug happen because like, the immune system can't fight those? Well, the superbugs that become resistant, they have a lot of different mechanisms where they can become resistant to the antibiotics. For example, if, and I don't know, well, if an antibiotic prevents the bacteria from producing cell wall, and if the antibiotic interferes with a critical enzyme in that cell wall pathway, then if the, the bacteria is, can somehow either circumvent that, or you know, by mutation, a new gene will arise that makes the protein that's a little different, uh, so the antibiotic doesn't affect it, then it can, it can get around that. And since some antibiotics, some classes or families of antibiotics, work in a very similar way, then oftentimes the resistant pathways make them resistant to many antibiotics in that family. Okay. Did that answer your question? Where do implants come into play in that process? In what process? The antibiotic Well, if the antibiotic is affecting a critical enzyme in a pathway that makes cell walls, for example, and the bacteria can, by random mutation, have a gene that makes an enzyme that is not affected by the antibiotic, or by random mutation makes a gene that produces a substance which prevents the antibiotic from maybe entering the bacterial cell or breaks down the antibiotic itself, then it's not going to work. Okay? Yeah. Is that why uh, you have to take your antibiotics in the ratio of it? You know, no, I don't think that's why. And I honestly, I've often wondered that, and I'm not quite sure. I think it's so that you you take the, for the life of the antibiotic, so that it you ensure that you kill as many or all of the bacteria as possible, so you're not leaving some alive that could possibly then be resistant. I think I'm not sure I've wondered that as well. All right, so that's how we're going to wrap up enzymes. All right. So think about all the bug sprays you spray in your backyard. Anybody had the bug guy come? Yeah? So he's spraying chemicals, which are basically enzyme inhibitors. And we don't know what knock-on effects they have and what your enzyme pathways they're affecting, right? Yeah? There was a study done looking at sperm count on men on the east and west coast. Who had the highest sperm count? 
East Coast men did, and what was their speculation for the cause? In the West was very agriculturalized, lots more pesticide sprayed, more ambient, higher ambient levels of pesticide on the West Coast, which they believed was responsible for the lower sperm counts. So, even though these things really hit insects, they probably have an effect on many other organisms. Okay. That's it. Any more questions on enzymes? Any questions on enzymes? Sure. Clear as mud or crystal clear? Clear as mud. How can we set that in unison? We did it really clear. <laughs> Alright. So now we're going to move on to the cell cycle, and that kind of catches us up and puts us back in sync with that. You need to update your slides. It's chapter 11. Yeah, I know. You know, and when they come out with different editions of the textbook, I really thought about doing that, but then it got kind of funny when students would say, you need to update your slides in this different chapter. I kind of think that's... <laughs> no? I guess I'm easier than you. Okay, so, chapter 11, the cell cycle, not 12. Have you got an old edition of the book? And is it chapter 12? Oh, that's another good reason for not updating it, because you can use an old edition of the textbook. There you go. Well, no, the eighth edition is chapter 12 also. It does. Jessica, what are you doing? Jessica. I have the eighth edition. You're I looking at cell me. communication, oh. <laughs> cell cycle. <laughs> so I'm actually right with this chapter number. Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> All right, so in lab, we looked in quite a lot of depth at mitosis and meiosis. So in lecture, I'm not going to go over the ins and outs of mitosis and meiosis so much. All right, we're going to look at some uh, a broader look at those processes, but also I want to spend some time to talk about cancer when we talk about the cell cycle. All right, because I think most of you find cancer quite interesting. I do. All right, so roles of the cell cycle, in particular, cell division. But first, I'm going to talk about mitosis. So most of this next section I'm going to talk about relates to mitosis. So when I talk about cell division in this next section, I'm referring to mitosis, not meiosis. All right? If I'm going to refer to meiosis, I'll specifically say meiosis. I won't use the word cell division. Okay, mitosis. How do you spell mitosis? How do you spell mitosis? M I T O S I S. So, roles of mitosis include then and meiosis. All right. No, let me backtrack. Mitosis. We'll keep it simple. Mitosis. Mitosis has a role in some organisms in reproduction. Some organisms reproduce simply by dividing into two. And they divide into two by mitotic cell divisions. What would be an example of an organism that reproduces by dividing into two? <coughs> Not worms. Amoeba, bacteria. So many protists and I think virtually all bacteria reproduce by dividing into two new cells. Okay. You said they did it by what process? Mitosis. <coughs> Mitosis is important in growth. It's how you grow. Look. There we've got two cells that result from the division of one. The one cell that you started off life as after the sperm fertilized the egg. And you keep dividing. And you keep dividing until how many cells in an adult? About 60 trillion, right? It's a lot of cell divisions. And also tissue repair. 
as your tissues become damaged, they need to be replaced. And replacing tissues and cells within tissues is achieved by mitotic cell divisions, right? So mitosis then, reproduction in some organisms, growth and tissue repair. So, a dividing cell, a dividing cell first, or a cell that's about to divide, first has to replicate its DNA. First it makes a carbon copy of its entire genome. Then, it wraps that DNA up, or packages that DNA into chromosomes. And then it separates those two identical copies of the genome, separates them by separating chromosomes. At this point, each chromosome is made of two identical halves. It separates those two identical halves. And those of you that are in lab today, will, you'll see how that works. Those of you that are in lab on Wednesday, makes sense, right? And then, once you've separated those two sets of chromosomes, once you've undergone nuclear division, the cell can actually divide into two. So then that one parent cell splits into two identical daughter cells. So there's sort of three basic stages. <coughs> You've got some preparation, the actual separation of the genomes by separate chromosomes, and then the cell has to split into two. So genome, just to update you or to um, clarify some of the definitions, think of your genome as all of the DNA in your cell, or at least all of the <coughs> DNA in the nucleus. And it's your set of genetic instructions, right? Your full set of genetic instructions. With a few exceptions, each and every cell in your body has an identical copy of your genome. Right? With a few exceptions, each and every cell has an identical copy of your genome. So the cells in your liver have the same genome as cells in a hair follicle. Exactly the same. Now, genomes can be small. Some organisms have very small genomes. What would be an example of an organism with a very small genome? Yeah, bacteria. Bacteria have very small genomes. The bacterial cell is small. And the reactions they carry out are, are not relatively simple compared to yours. Or genomes can be large. Now you might think we have a large genome, but certain plants have much bigger genomes and have multiple copies of their genome as the norm. It's kind of weird. So large genomes then are managed, when it comes to cell division, they're managed by packaging. <coughs> parts of the genome into these structures called chromosomes. And they're just really organizational units that make cell division a much more organized process. It's why you pack your stuff into boxes when you move house. You get it organized. So eukaryotic chromosomes then.
your DNA in your cells, in your nucleus, is present as a substance called chromatin. And chromatin is the DNA complexed with proteins called histones. <coughs> now, how long is your DNA molecule in each of your cells? About two meters long. Okay, it's about two meters long. And it's not, you know, tightly packed like a big wadded up ball of street, but it's organized. You've got these histone proteins, which are these disc-shaped proteins, and they're kind of like um, a bobby that you put thread around. And the DNA is wound around them, and then it winds around another histone protein. Like that. Okay. So the histone sort of helps keep the DNA organized. So chromatin then is the DNA complex for the histone proteins. <clears throat> and then when they make chromosomes, the chromatin sort of packages and coils itself very tightly in a very organized fashion. And so we can actually see it through a light microscope. We can't see chromatin through a microscope, but we can see chromosomes. Chromatin makes up chromosomes. And there are other proteins involved. I don't know why it's only playing on one projector. Oh, yes, I do. I've got to tell you, when I saw this DVD, it gave me goosebumps. All right? It's been out a while. But it was so brilliant to see some of this stuff. The animations on it are, are, are amazing. But it has been out a while, so I don't get goosebumps anymore. But it's still remarkable. So.
right, I'll try another thing. So see if we can play it in the computer, and maybe the computer will allow me to control this. Like this. Oh, is that it? Talk to the media guys while I'm here. <laughs> oh. So I'll play it next time. We'll see if we can get it figured out. I don't know what the deal is. Sorry? I know! Just before the weekend as well! Oh! show you shows an animated version of how the DNA or the chromatin winds itself up into chromosomes. So up here, oh look, we've got the screen look. Has it? Well here's our DNA molecule up there, the double helix. The double helix is wound around these histone proteins. They're then further coiled and then we take that thread and we sort of wind it backwards and forwards like that. Okay. And here we've got the sizes of the, of the molecule and then how it's packaged and wound. And then we'll take that coil and fold it up again. You can see how it's sort of organized. You just sort of alternate fold it back and forth, back and forth until we package it tightly enough and densely enough and it grows so big that we can actually see these as chromosomes. Right? So there is a chromosome. And at this point, the chromosome is made of two identical halves, right? This is one half, there's the other half, or the other part, two identical parts. And they're attached at this part here, which is the centrum here. Okay. So if you were to look at chromosomes on a microscope slide. And I told the Friday group, uh, sorry, the Wednesday group, how you can do this, but I'll tell you all again as a class. Um, when I was in grad school, I took a microscopy class and we looked at our own chromosomes. And we took a blood sample, and the cells that we were targeting were the white blood cells, because white blood cells have a nucleus, red blood cells don't, all right, in mammals. In birds they do, in reptiles they do, but mammals they don't. And so you take that little blood sample, you add some things to it to stimulate the white blood cells to divide. They divide, and of course division means that the DNA gets copied, packaged into chromosomes. And so you leave it for about a week, and you've got a culture of your own cells that are undergoing division. And so many of them have got chromosomes. And then what you do is you take a little pipette, it's a remarkable thing to do. You take a pipette, and you take one little, you know, little bit of the cell culture and you hold it one foot 30 centimeters right above a microscope slide and you let one drip drip down and the drip goes splat and that splat is just enough splat to break open the cell break open the nucleus and kind of spread the chromosomes around nicely so it sort of look a little bit like that if you're lucky all right 
and then you fix it, you stain it, and you can see your own chromosomes. Okay, so let's have a look at the cell cycle then. Now the cell cycle, unlocking the secrets of the cell cycle and the mechanisms that regulate it, huge area of research for a lot of different reasons. But one of those reasons is to examine cancer. Because cancer, cancer cells are simply normal body cells that have lost the normal regulatory mechanisms that tell the cell when to divide and when to stop dividing. Okay. And it's mutation in certain genes, the accumulation of mutation in certain genes that cause the cells to lose their ability to regulate the cell cycle, to regulate when the cell divides and when the cell stops dividing. Basically what cancer is, Okay. Build up a mutation. You can inherit some of those mutated genes, or the genes can become mutated by things like viruses, by things like chemicals, sometimes random mistakes. Okay? Radiation is another cause of mutation. Alright, so understanding the cell cycle is important. So, let's have a look at the cell cycle, sort of an overview, and I like this graphic quite a lot. You can break down the cell cycle into two main stages, interphase and the mitotic phase. So let's have a look at how it applies to this graphic. This outer band shows you interphase, and then we've got the mitotic phase. So the mitotic phase is when the cell divides, <coughs> nuclear and cellular division. An interphase is the part of the cell cycle when the cell performs all of its normal functions and also gets ready for cell division. Okay? So interphase then is the part of the cell cycle when the cell carries out all of its normal functions for that cell type and prepares for cell division. That's what interphase is all about. Yes. Interphase is part of the cell cycle when the cell performs all of its normal functions and gets ready for cell division. An interphase itself can be broken down into three stages. So G1 is one of the phases of interphase, and G1 follows the mitotic phase. Now G1 is called the first gap phase. G1 stands for gap one. First gap phase. And it's in G1 that the cell carries out all of the normal functions of the cell. So if you're a liver cell, you do everything a liver cell is meant to do. If you're a hair follicle cell, you do all the things a hair follicle cell is meant to do. And if there are appropriate triggers, after a certain amount of time, the cell will leave the G1 phase and it will enter the S phase. And the S phase, think of the S as standing for synthesis, DNA synthesis. During the S phase, it's when the cell pretty much stops performing all of its normal functions. But during the S phase, it replicates its DNA. It makes a copy of its entire genome. But if, yeah. so it's like carbon one right, it stops. It stops carrying out all its normal functions, which it does in the G1 phase. And it starts to replicate its DNA. And we'll look at DNA replication in a later week and how it does that. Once all the DNA has been copied. So at this point in the cell, we've got twice the normal amount of DNA. Okay. Then it enters this second gap phase. And the second gap phase is when it prepares for division. So maybe it makes um, more mitochondria. 
So it's getting ready for cell division. It's doing all the things, maybe making certain proteins that wouldn't ordinarily be made. <coughs> so it's preparing for cell division. So, S phase, all of your DNA is copied. You can't see chromosomes in the S phase, but that's why each chromosome is made of two identical halves. Okay. This half is exactly the same as this half genetically. Okay. You can't see the chromosomes yet, at least in the S phase. And each half of the chromosome we call a chromatid. Right? Each half of the chromosome we call the chromatid. And they're attached to the centromere. Now in this instance, we've got a chromosome which is made of two chromatids. We call those chromatids sister chromatids. Okay. okay. So let's have a look at this mitotic phase then. The mitotic phase can be broken down into two separate stages. We've got mitosis and cytokinesis. Okay. Mitosis and cytokinesis. Now, mitosis is nuclear division. It's where the chromosomes sister chromatids separate and you end up really with one nucleus essentially divides into two nuclei so it's nuclear division and cytokinesis is when the cell itself divides into two cells that's cellular division essentially the cytoplasm splits Two cells. So that one more time about cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is when the cell divides into two. Here's a cell, here's a nucleus. Think of the mitosis part of having two nuclei. Then cytokinesis would be where this. One cell divides into two. Remember, it pinches in like that to form two new cells. Okay. You said the cytokinesis is, or I'm sorry, the mitosis is just the nucleus. <laughs> mitosis is nuclear division. Cytokinesis is when the cell divides into two. And mitosis is a very, very, very reliable process. Only one mistake every 10,000 divisions on average. Sorry? Oh, 100,000. What did I say? Did I say 10,000? Sorry, 100,000. So thank goodness, right? Because you're undergoing thousands of cell divisions every day. What do you think happens in the cells where there's a mistake made? Sorry? The lysosomes eat it. They don't quite eat it, but yeah, you're on the right track. So those cells usually are, are flagged and it's like, oh, bad mistake, let's break it down. Okay. And lysosomes are an important part of that. 